I was in Nigeria. I say hello to all of our Nigeria friends and all those at the compound. And uh, I just say hug the kids for me. It was really, really awesome to be there, to see them, and to see what's going on. I mean, in just a short time, God has opened up some really amazing things there. He really has. And, and one thing that, I'll, I'll say this, I was talking to Michael maybe two days before we left or something like that, or before I left, and uh, um, I said, you know something that we need? Because this country is all about, well, what we call soccer, right? They call it football. I invite them to come over to America and we'll show them what football is. <laughs> I'm kidding. But what we need is we need to get involved somehow, and, and, and they do on the compound. They go out and they play, play soccer with the kids and stuff like that. And I said, but what if, I, I don't know, what if we started a league here? What if, what if we did something to get involved in the community around this soccer that'll just bring out the kids, bring out the parents, bring out everybody? And, and he looked at me and he, he said, you know, that's just amazing. He said, because the Lord had laid that on my heart. And he said, if you look just over there, and, and he pointed, I, I don't even know how far, because it's there. Now that I see it, I see it every time, but I never saw it before. But there's this huge stadium where they have this civic association of teams that come together and do all this soccer, and they come together all the time. And, and I thought, what a perfect, perfect opportunity to get involved. And, and so God had already laid that on Michael's heart and already moving forward with things like that. I'm excited for what God is doing there because he's opening doors. I'm excited with Gabe and Maeve about to go there. We were preparing their, we, you guys don't get an actual room, by the way. We, we just, we, we feel you need to learn some things, so we're having a hut built right outside the wall, okay? No, I'm kidding. No, but we're, we're getting ready for them to be able to come. By the way, pray about that, because uh, we, we still need Yvonne's passport. I mean, it's insane. We have not received her passport yet, and we need Maeve's passport. And, and first, you need your social security card, right, with your new name. And what we need to pray is, is that that will come quickly and that we can get her passport quickly. Because I believe we're supposed to go back before the end of September. That, that's, that's what I believe. And, and in going back, now, they would go back uh, to stay, but then there would be many of us that would go back for a trip. And God has some amazing things planned for that trip and that time. And it, it's just keep that in prayer because Satan wants to come against every opportunity that we have there. And in every time that he comes against, what we are seeing is it results in huge failure on his part. And in literal loss on his part in, in terms of, uh, of the movement there. So, so keep that in prayer. It was, it was so awesome to be there. And the, the compound is, is really coming along. Um, they're doing such a great job. We, we actually bought our first, uh, it's not really a motorcycle. I, I call it a tricycle because it's a, it's a motorcycle with this dump cart looking thing on the back. And we've been wanting to get one for a long time because some of the roads there are, are not so good on some of the vehicles. That's why we shipped out that truck. By the way, having that truck out there, it, for those of you who are familiar with what truck I'm talking about, what a joy. I mean, we had been trying to ship that out there for so long, and it's finally there. And I mean, I, I want to say in the first couple days, we pulled out two vehicles uh, because it's heavy rainy season there. We had some people come and buy, buy some block from us and got their truck stuck. And so we hooked up the winch and we pulled them out and it was awesome. 
and people are starting to notice our involvement there in the community. So, so keep that in prayer. It, uh, it, it really is going to ramp up very quickly, what God is doing. And I did have a chance to talk with the governor. We met for a while, uh, me, him, uh, Michael, and the chief of staff. The Lord did give me a word. I'm not going to share that this morning, but, uh, uh, but I, I will say it resonated with him, and he knows it. I think that was probably confirmation for him. You will see it play out shortly. But uh, um, that was the main reason for, uh, for the Lord having me go there on this trip. Um, but keep that in prayer. And before we get into this this morning, let's pray. Father, we worship you and we praise you. We love you. Lord, I thank you for bringing each of us here this morning. Father, I thank you for bringing those online that will consume this word this morning. You have great intention for it to penetrate their hearts. You have great intention for us to understand your will, for us to understand what you have, what you are doing. Because if we do not have your eyes, if we do not understand your heart, then we can never begin to understand your ways. So, Father, we ask for your heart this morning. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit, as you already have, to prepare our hearts to hear. And for the things that we don't understand to open doors for us to seek that understanding. That's what you promise. That's what you promise in what you do in our lives. So, Father, we say yes, and we ask just that you do it. Just that you do it, Father. I ask that you speak through me. Father, I have no desire for any of these words to be my own. Father, you know my heart. I have no desire. I would rather not speak because I only want to hear from you. I certainly don't want to be responsible for my own words unless they are filled by you. So, Father, only allow into my mouth what it is that you want me to speak. And I will speak it. I will not shy away. I will speak what you want me to speak because it is what you have ordained for your bride to hear. So give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Even those that will listen to this podcast or watch this in the future. Father, allow your Holy Spirit to remain on that word. We worship you and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was talking with the Lord this morning, he gave me a couple of concepts that we talked about. And (laughs) not exactly sure how they work together, but that's up to him. In my conversation, he said something that surprised me. It wasn't the answer that I thought that he was going to give. But he asked me a question. He said, do you know which gift is the hardest to yield? Do you know which gift is the hardest to steward? Do you know which gift of the Spirit is the hardest, the most difficult to maintain with me in control, being God in control? And I started to think about it, and I thought, well, healing maybe, maybe miracles, because that's not quite as clearly defined. Maybe tongues, because those can go rampant if, if you're not walking in purity. No, no, you know what? It's got to be prophecy, because... Paul said in all three, 
three circumstances and all three lists of the giftings to pursue that and pursue it with all that you have. So, so Lord, my answer is prophecy. Eh, wrong. He didn't give me a second guess. He just told me. It's mercy. That surprised me. That floored me. And I said, why? Why is mercy the hardest to, to steward? He said, because mercy by its nature requires you to look for, through a certain lens for it to be him. See, to have this gift of mercy, to understand mercy, you have to be able to look through his lens. Because if you can't, then there's a large part of the word of God that you cannot explain. There is a large part of the word of God that you have to just kind of close up and pretend that it didn't exist. Or perhaps what you do is you say, we're under, under a new covenant now, and that doesn't matter. See, that's how God used to operate under the law. And he doesn't operate that way any longer under grace. You couldn't be more wrong if that's what you believe. First of all, the Bible says all scripture, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is God breathed. All scripture. That means even the scripture where God pushes forward his justice. His judgment. Now see, if you're looking through the wrong lens of what mercy is, it's easy to look at that and say, that's not God. God would never blank. Oh, be careful of that statement. Be careful of that statement. God would never blank. Or God would never have me blank. All of us have gone through that. Alexis has given a testimony about that many times, about God would never send me to Africa. <laughs> How'd that work out for you? And she's going in September. You can't say God would never. What you can say is what he says he would never do. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will never lie because God cannot lie. God cannot sin. So in those circumstances, you could, you could say, God would never. God would never lie to me. God would never sin. God would never leave me or forsake me. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that I don't do my best to push him out. <laughs> even under false circumstances, even not realizing that I'm pushing him out, but yet by sin, I am pushing him out. So this idea of mercy being one of the gifts that is the hardest to steward is really something that I, I, I'm, I'm going to give a little invitation here. And, and I haven't even talked to Alexis about this, but, well, I'm talking to you now. <laughs> I, I, think, I think God wants to kind of flush this out a little bit at the gifts meeting this coming Saturday. I want to encourage you to come to this gifts meeting because I think what he has for this gifts meeting will be really important to hear. Flushing out this idea of the lens that we see mercy through. Because if we don't get this, guys, if the bride doesn't get this, it's going to be a difficult road for her. And for many it will be. Because if you look through the lens of your own levels of what you think is right and wrong, of what you think should be done and should not be done, you're going to go wrong every time. 
every single time. If you look through the lens of somebody else, if you look through my lens, you take a great risk, by the way. Let me, let me make something clear here. For all of you online, you guys here know this, but for all of you on, online, I am not trying to convince you to believe anything I believe. Forgive me for my callousness, but I really could care less. That's not my job. My job is to speak it. That's the only job the Lord gave me was to speak it. It is on you as you listen. It is on you to prove it out. Acts 17, 11. Be as the Bereans. Prove it out. Take it before the Lord. But here's a problem. If you do not have relationship with the Lord, and I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about justification of sin because you invited Jesus Christ into your heart. That's just the beginning. If you don't have relationship with him where you can go and you can hear his voice, then you're going to have some trouble. You need his lens. That's why we talk about it every single week, about relationship with him. I'm not trying to build relationship between you and I so you could just believe me and we'll all be okay. <laughs> At some point, I won't be here. If you're relying on me, you're making a mistake. At some point, whoever you are relying on as a human being, if your lens of belief is through them, you're making a mistake. It doesn't mean you can't learn from them because you do and you need to. And we come together in times like this to hear from the Lord. And we do hear from the Lord, but that doesn't take away your responsibility of taking it before the Lord yourself. Because he'll never lie. The difficult part is discernment. Because, see, the enemy will lie. The enemy will portray himself as a spirit of light. And when he gets into our paradigm of mercy, he wreaks havoc in the bride. He tears it apart. God's justice will bring that to bear. It is. He is bringing that to bear. Because we are in a time where he will allow that no longer. I want to turn somewhere. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, we're going to start at uh, verse 16. This is, this is just after, in Luke's version of the gospel, this is just after Jesus had been baptized and would, then went through the testing in the wilderness. And this was literally the first thing he dealt with. He goes, goes back to Nazareth, which is where he was from. And we'll, we'll take it up with verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he'd, he had been brought up. He grew up there as a, as a child. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. But this was a very important day. This was a very important Sabbath. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is what it says in Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Let me, let me rephrase that a little bit. He has sent me to bring freedom to those who are enslaved. Okay? And recovering the sight recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed or to set to give freedom to those who are oppressed, 
and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now at this point, he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the grace of his words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is, is this not Joseph's son? And I, I, I won't continue on, but things turned south for Jesus real quick, speaking truth. It was very fast that the crowd turned on him, led him out to a cliff only to, with the intent of throwing him off and killing him. And I love it because Jesus just went away. I mean, how awesome, how awesome. Can you imagine? It, it, it said in verse 30, but passing through their midst, he went away. I mean, and these were people that they knew who he was. He grew up with them. So it's not like the, the crowd didn't really recognize him as he walked through to get away. Oh, I hope, does, hope they don't see me. No, it was much like when Peter was taken from the, from, from the guards in prison where he was miraculously taken of the Holy Spirit and they didn't see it. That's what happened here. But Jesus made a profound statement. He took the law, he took the word of God and he said, today this is fulfilled in your ears literally proclaiming to be the Son of God. If you go back, and we'll turn there here in a second, but if you, if you go to Isaiah where that was written, it was that that was speaking of the Messiah, of the coming one. And he said literally, and this is why, why it upset them so much, he said literally today this is fulfilled. But something extraordinary was already at play. And I, I want you to go there. Turn to Isaiah chapter 61. This is, and this can sound familiar because it's what Jesus just read. Isaiah 61, we'll, beginning, we'll begin at the first verse. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives or to bring freedom to those who are enslaved and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's where he stopped. But if you dive into the Hebrew there, you find something very interesting. See, the Hebrew back then, it wasn't, there was no punctuation back then. We, we have it added in, in our versions here because it really helps, right? It helps separate a thought. In, in original Hebrew, they didn't have punctuation, and so, so they separated a thought by that thought itself. And if you look at the, the origination of this, there was... No stopping. In, in our version, we see a comma right there. And, and that's, that's accurate because the thought did not stop when Isaiah wrote it down. But yet Jesus stopped it at that point, which is interesting. Doesn't, doesn't kind of put in your mind why? Why didn't he read the whole thing? I'm going to tell you what I think about this. Because the next part, the second half of verse 2 says this, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Whew. Okay, recognize what he's saying here. At his time when he came, he said, today this is filled this is fulfilled in this time, in your ears. This prophecy was fulfilled. It is done. It is finished. It is, a, it is brought before you, and you are held accountable for it. But the peace that he did not say was fulfilled was yet for another time. That's why he stopped. It wasn't that that was just the part 
of Isaiah's prophecy that was good or applied or, or, or you know, was from God. The entire thing was. Go back and read, read all, if you go back a couple of chapters and forward a couple of chapters from 61, you get a broader view of what's going on here. Because it is a a 30,000 foot picture of God's redemption. Redemption did not become complete with Jesus dying on the cross. His part of it was complete. He said, it is finished. But what it came down to was the agreement with individuals to accept him as Messiah. Do you know when it's fully complete for you? When you accept Jesus as Savior, when you accept him as the Messiah, when you receive what he has said is truth and you apply it to your lives. That's the only time it benefits you. It doesn't benefit you if you don't accept him. It doesn't benefit you if you don't believe him. So please understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying he did not complete it, but he allowed by our choice for the sake of love, he allowed our participation to be required for it to be completed in your life. But yet, that is a single myopic view of his plan. Because he does have an overall plan. He does have an overall plan of readying his bride, of making his bride ready for him. Revelation 3, 9. The entire book of the Song of Songs lays out the picture of what that relationship is to look like. That's why God said marriage is to look like a picture of our relationship with him. The problem in understanding that is, honestly, we have as as human beings, especially now in today's atmosphere, we have a very skewed understanding of what love is. We have a very skewed understanding of marriage and what that is. It's not a ticket to have sex. I mean, praise God that that's part of it. But that's not at all what it is. It is a relationship that is supposed to be closer than anything else would be. Alexis is supposed to be the person closest to me than anyone else, including my kids, including my parents, including my friends. And yet, wait a second, Lord, she's the one that knows my buttons. How is she supposed to be the closest when she's the one that knows how to push those buttons? That's all part of it. That's all part of building that trust Building that trust in our relationship with the Lord is the same way. It is being vulnerable with him. Saying, I'm hurting. I don't understand. I don't know. And he says, yeah, but I need you to step. I need you to step and trust me. I know it hurts. I know it hurts. I know it's difficult. Nothing of value ever comes without pain. I mean, it comes with work. Building relationship is work. The reason why he stopped then and he did not finish the rest of what Isaiah was prophesying was because that was coming for a different time. And I am declaring to you, we are in that time. We are in that time where the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. You know what that means? That means those hearts that are entwined with his, crying out to him and saying, this injustice cannot go on. He said, you're right. And it's time. So I will move. But yet be careful of your lens. Because his movement is not as we would move. 
if we put a lens on there of everything being nice, <laughs> good luck with that. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked for 2,000 years. What makes you think it's going to work now? There is no consolation between the world and the bride, or there's not supposed to be. He said in Genesis 3, I will put enmity between your seed and my seed. Enmity. I will make you enemies. But then later he said, love your enemy. So it's not that you hate your enemy, but recognize that you cannot compromise what God has just to have peace. You can't. And that brings me to the main thought that he gave me this morning. Is freedom worth fighting for? I mean, take that to your heart and really think about it. Because you're going to face it. Is freedom really worth fighting for? I bet if you asked... Those in the Afghan church, they'd tell you, yeah. In fact, I want to read a couple of things to you. I received this, um, and this is not somebody that I know firsthand. It's just a group that I received it from. But this, this was... some direct statements from people that are there in Afghanistan that are Christians in the underground church there, which, by the way, was one of the fastest growing underground Christian churches in the world. Isn't it amazing how in those places of turmoil, there's amazing growth? It's like the choice could not be more stark. Right? The choice is clear there. Right? And yet it's, it's the most growing. Well, th this is something that, that I read a couple of days ago. And this is from one of the groups here that was in contact with people there. We received news that the underground church in Kabul, Afghanistan, has been martyred. Our friends, and th they were talking of a particular church that they work with, that they had kind of like what we do in Nigeria. Our friends have been in contact and met together last night in deep prayer in Afghanistan. The last words she spoke was this. We feel your prayers because this supernatural boldness came over us and we were singing in the spirit, even the kids, even the children said, Mom, we will not deny Jesus. And as they were on the phone with them, they heard screaming and they heard gunshots. God is so powerful. They went to be with their creator filled with joy. They ended it by saying, we will be fasting tomorrow for the church is still fighting. Please join us. And then just this morning... I read something that Glenn Beck had put out, and I want to read this to you as well. It's just after midnight. This was last night. It's just after midnight central time, and I just received my final briefing on the rescue operation for those on what I call the Nazarenes list. It is not good. Thousands are inside the airport grounds, but no planes are flying. Thousands more are outside the gates. Many have been beaten, whipped, and some have been shot by Taliban thugs. Mothers and fathers have passed their children over the fences, some of them even throwing them over in hopes that they will be caught and cared for and live their life in America. ISIS killers are now joining the ranks of the Taliban. I suppose ignoring their differences until the infidels are caught 
tortured, and killed. They have the names, the names we have. Those who converted to Christianity. I have personally heard from some that are in hiding. They are not afraid to die, but they want their children to live and live free. Our brave teams are in grave danger. Our pilots are in grave danger the minute the airspace opens up. It is chaos on the ground and no sign it, it is going to get better anytime soon. In fact, as we get closer to the 31st deadline, the worse it will get. Tens of thousands still need to get out. The resources are there. Courage of all is on a dramatic rise. The will is strong, but chaos and evil have been waiting for this moment. We need the Lord to help. I would ask humbly that today, Sunday, or Monday, you would fast and pray. Beg God to forgive our sins as individuals and as a nation. Ask him for the sake of others that he would part the skies and open the path to safety. That he would blind the Taliban so the good may operate without detection. It will take divine providence and true miracles to save even a fraction of these people who have done no wrong. Please ask your churches, friends, and family to join us in fasting, prayer, and humility for miracles we are not worthy of, but those we are trying to save surely do. If you ask the church in Afghanistan, if freedom is worth fighting for. That's what they'll tell you. Do you think if Stephen was asked if freedom was worth fighting for, what do you think he would have said? Stephen, who was stoned to death, and, and it was approved by, by Paul, or at that time Saul, he was stoned to death, and yet he saw the glory of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord shone on his face. And the testimony to this day lives. So was it worth the price he paid for freedom? Yeah. See, the thing is, freedom is not something that you can place human value on. If you don't look at freedom through the proper lens, then it's just going to confuse you. If you think freedom is about an ease of life, or to not be beaten, to not be killed, to not have trouble, then you've got the wrong lens of what that freedom is and what it costs But as I said before, that second part of what Isaiah had prophesied is now ringing in our ears, and it is for today, because God has heard the cries of his children. And those cries, by the way, are not, come and help me. I mean, we, we all desire that. That's what the Church of Af Afghanistan wants. Certainly. They don't want to go through what they're going through. But what they want more than anything, as was evidenced in what I read, is God's pleasure. God's love. It filled them with joy in the face of death. Oh, man. I, all my life, I've grown up in and heard story, heard preachers preach about this sort of thing, and it never really hits home because we've never had to face this on our soil. I'm here to tell you we will. The Lord has said it. It is coming. We will face this on this soil because this is a final stand 
of the enemy. It's not because the enemy is growing stronger. Please understand that. God is fully in control of this. This is his justice, which justice and mercy do not oppose. You don't have one or the other. His perfect justice goes with his perfect mercy. Because what is his lens of mercy? It's what draws the bride to his son. It's what draws us in relationship to Jesus Christ. That is what it is. So the day of vengeance of our God is coming to comfort all who mourn. And, and, and by the way, if, if you don't believe that, I mean, the Lord has been telling us this for a long, long time. I, I remember, I think it's almost three years ago now, coming up in September, or is it two years? I, I can't remember. When was... Uh, when was, did COVID hit? Was that last year or the year before? March of 2020. Okay. <laughs> I don't do so well with time. Last year. Okay, so two years ago, September, the Lord had told us this is all coming. He reaffirmed it again, March of that, that next year. This is all coming. Don't be surprised. This is coming. Don't be surprised what is coming to your soil. Don't be surprised. And... Above all, don't be afraid. This is God's mercy. This is his justice. His mercy is that the bride has cried out, this remnant has cried out for intimacy with him. And part of that is the stewardship of this earth that we have been placed in charge of, that Adam gave away. He wants us to steward that. That's why when we cry out to him of these injustices, he will act. But understand, he will act in a way that is purified justice on his end. It's not just to relieve pain. It's not just to make someone feel better about something. It is always to draw him closer to us. That's why each of us have a choice. When these things start to happen, and, and by the way, you can't go somewhere to get away from it. You, you, I mean, good luck with that. You know, I, I might suggest, I don't know, maybe North Pole or something, see if you could stay with Santa. Maybe it's too cold for... Satan to go up there and work. I don't know. There's no place on this earth that you will be able to run and not face the decisions that God places before you because you are the prize. You are what he wants. And the bride has cried out for the stewardship of this earth and he's going to give it to her. He is going to give it to her. This is the process the process of judgment always comes to the church first. That's what he said in his word. His justice comes to the church first. Why? Because he works from a platform of purity. Just like you have to work from a platform of purity in your life. You cannot walk outside of purity and then expect God to be intimate with you. You can't do it. It doesn't work. That's why if you're doing that, your lens has to change. Your lens of understanding who he is, of understanding the purity of who he is and what he expects. And, and by the way, I'm not talking about purity of the law. That was tried. The law was what man thought that he could control by choosing to do something or not. And God said, okay, no problem. I'll give you my law. I'll give it to you. Good luck with it. God literally gave it for the purpose of man finally coming to the realization that he can't do it without God. And you can't either. 
None of us can. That's why when grace came, when Jesus died on the cross and gave grace, it allowed us not to have to live by that law. Kind of like, well, I, I do these 10 things, so there, I, I get this, you know, I'm right here with God. Boy, if I, if I could do 15 things, then I'll be here with God. See, in some ways, God made it even harder. In some ways, easier, because he did everything. In some ways, harder, because now you cannot have righteousness by simply doing and by choosing yourself to just do. Now your righteousness and your purity goes hand in hand with your relationship with the Lord, building that relationship with the Lord, trusting him to work through the process of your sin, of your paradigms of what that means. And, and some sin's obvious. That's not what I'm talking about. It's the sin that confuses us that is lethal to who we are. Okay, it, it's, it's not hard to see that, you know, if you go and get drunk every night, well, that's sin, and that hurts your relationship with the Lord. But maybe it's a little harder to see that when your mercy is in the wrong place, that that hurts your relationship with the Lord. Maybe it's a little harder to see that when you make passive-aggressive comments that are the opposite of transparency, by the way, that maybe that is okay. Do you know that is as devastating as going out and getting drunk? Because if you go out and get drunk, you're not going to have an effect on other people because they're going to see your stupidity. They are. But when you have a voice and you start to see things through the wrong lens, you see them out of a lens of selfishness in that mercy. And then you start with just little passive aggressive statements. You lead people and you lead them astray. And understand that there is a payment for that. Especially in the time in which we're in. You know, it's not only a teacher who is responsible for what they teach. We're all responsible for our effectiveness to other people. If you think I'm the only one responsible in this room right now, you're wrong. You're responsible for your choices, every single choice. You're responsible between you and the Lord to know his lens and to know what to take in. Well, yeah, but God would never, wouldn't he? God would never bring civil war to this country, but yet he's going to. God would never bring world war on this soil, but yet he's going to. In fact, the culmination of, the nation of what will happen in the final destruction of the enemy will happen on this soil. In fact, this coast. You don't have to believe me. Just jot it down somewhere. Because when it happens, you'll know it was from the Lord. Don't question his methods of readying the bride. Go through the process of understanding them. Go through the process of important to him. And, and how, by the way, do we learn? If, let, let's just say this. Let's say it was five years ago now, okay? And, or, or even, you know, whatever, back with George Bush. 
when the deep state was so thick and heavy and we, none of us knew about it, right? We didn't even know he was part of it, in my opinion. Check that one off. Allegedly. Yeah, allegedly, yeah. Prove it out yourself. Acts 17, 11. But back then, if God would have come with his judgment on all of that and just took them all out, how would we have reacted? How would we have understood that to be? We wouldn't have. Because there was no transparency in what was going on. So see, when God heard the cries, and, and God's reaction right now, I really look at it two different ways. Because God's reaction, in one part, it's because it's the time, right? You know, we, we know that there is a time frame for man. We know the Bible says there is a time of the Gentiles. And, and at some point, that time is complete, right? So there is time involved. So, so in, one, in one way, it fits into that timeline. But I think that's the smaller of the two. I think the bigger of the two is God has been hearing the cries of his remnant. God has been hearing the cries of those who have relationship with him and said, Lord, Lord, when, 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 when? just like David cried, why, why, why do, do my enemies triumph over me when, when you are in me? So they're triumphing over you. Why, why, Lord? And the Lord said, look, and this is in the Psalms, he said, Look at their destination. Look at their destiny. And you'll understand why I am patient. Why my mercy has patience. But you know the thing about patience? There comes a point where patience is complete. Patience is not forever ongoing. Because then it no longer is patience. It's just not doing it. <laughs> God is patient with each one of us in our sin up until the point when that door is closed. One obvious way is our death, right? We can't ask forgiveness for our sin after we have already died. So that door closes upon our death. Now, we also know that there are times even in our life where that door becomes closed. A door that only Jesus can open and only Jesus can shut. Because the Father gives people to him. Yet they're drawn by the Father. If you don't believe me, 1 Corinthians 5 will explain that to you. That's what it means to give that person over to Satan. To literally take the covering of protection off that person. That door then becomes closed. Now praise God, in that instance... In 1 Corinthians 5, when you read 2 Corinthians, that person was restored. So that door was reopened. That person was restored. But understand that the cries of his remnant are, Lord, come and do something. So in the process of him doing it, he will always disclose why. It may not be in the moment, but it will be in time. Because he wants you to see his righteousness. What is happening now is exposing. It's making transparent all of those things that the enemy hides and has hidden for, for literally centuries. And guess what? That exposure is painful. It's painful because of the sin that we have been steeped in as a people. Whoever is in charge, right? You're seeing it in Afghanistan. I, I believe, and I'll just, just throw in my two cents here for a second. I do believe we're supposed to be out of Afghanistan. I believe we should have been out of there a long time ago because I believe, in my opinion, it's a way for them to perpetuate money. Whoever's in control of this whole thing, whatever. We should have been out of there a long time ago. But the problem is, the feckless leadership that didn't allow it to be the way that it should be. 
We should be out of there now and say, look, guys, you touch our people, we will destroy you. We don't even have to get on the ground to do it. We'll destroy you from the air. See, that's the position Ronald Reagan had, and it worked. That's the position Donald Trump had. Guess what? It worked. In fact, it really irritated people, but it worked. We don't have to manipulate other countries to produce the right thing. If we just do what's right ourselves and show that position of power of the Lord working through us, trust me, the Lord will do it. He will keep them in line. But that's the process that he's going through right now. He's showing the transparency. He's showing the, the things that are behind the scenes. You're, it, and it, it's so wild to watch if you watch the news at all. If you don't, man, I just in, encourage you, start watching it. It's better than any sitcom you could watch. I mean, now we're starting to see all these people that, that thought you know, Biden and Kamala were gods or whatever they were, and, and now they're starting to turn on them. Oh, what happened? Well, first of all, it wasn't Biden. It's not Koala. Sorry. No, it's, it's their choices. It's the God they serve. Their, their positions can't be right because they serve the God who is against Yahweh. God is showing that. So will you stand? Will you stand in that? Is freedom worth that fight? Freedom in this country, is it worth it? You're going to be asked that. You're going to face that. What will your response be? But do you know in all candor, in all truth, that's the less important. Less important than the next one is your own freedom valued to you? Is it worth fighting for? Your own freedom in Christ. Freedom from sin. Freedom from the bondage that sin brings. The authorities, which is a word you'll, you'll hear here. Freedom from the authorities of bondage that come on our life when we step in sin. When we literally give the enemy the right to be with us and to control us. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6. God said he doesn't want us to be slaves to sin. We were set free of that slavery. He wants us to literally be slaves to righteousness, slaves to God. Let's start at verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? And, and you know what? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little slash in there. And I'm going to add a word that has part of the meaning of that word righteousness. And I'm going to reread it. Which, either, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness through relationship. That's where righteousness comes from. In that intimate walk with the Lord. If you don't believe me, go ask David. Go read the Psalms. Go read about his life. I mean, a man who went through exorbitant sin and paid a price for it and yet found favor in God's eyes and intimacy with him in relationship. Verse 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. 
In other words, he's saying, I'm, I'm saying it in these terms so you can understand what I'm saying. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. That word sanctification there means relationships. Relationship. It means that interpersonal relationship that you build with God. That is our sanctification. For when you, verse 20, for, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting in that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to relationship. And its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. He's saying here that we do not have to be a slave to sin. In fact, he doesn't want us to be a slave to sin. That's what Jesus paid for. But our choice is not a middle-of-the-road choice. We are either slaves to sin or we are a slave to God. We either give everything to him, or when we hold back, don't think you're just holding back for yourself. Anything you hold back from God, you are giving to the enemy, flat out. That's truth. Anything that you don't give to God, don't think you're holding it for yourself, you are giving it to, to the enemy. You're making a choice between one and the other. And when he came, when Jesus came and freed us from that sin, it wasn't just what he did. Because I could stand here and, you know, let, let's, say, let's say that I'm steeped in sin. Let's say that I'm an alcoholic or a drug user. Or I lie, I, I steal, and whatever. I'm just steeped in sin. Well, yeah, but Jesus, I'm saved. And, and you know, you came and paid for all that. So really, this is on you. I mean, you, you said it is finished and you did everything you needed to do. And don't forget that because of love, he gave you choice. He's never going to force you to choose him, ever. He wants you to choose him. That's what love is. And so often we don't. We'll choose him in the broader scale, but when it comes down to the little things that we want to control in our own lives, we don't choose him. We choose to stay as slaves to that sin. And I'm not saying that, that well, you could just be, be, you know, make this choice and all of a sudden be sinless and you, you will never sin again. No, as long as we are in these fallen bodies, then there is an influence that will come against us, temptations that will come against us. That's why it's a fight every day. That's why the relationship with the Lord isn't required for just a single choice. Yeah, God, I'm good. I want relationship with you. Now I'm just good until I die. No, it's a, it's a daily thing. It's a daily fight. It's a daily requirement to press in it's a daily requirement to build relationship. I mean, how would that have been if, if when Alex and I got married, I said, I said, awesome, okay, we're married now, we have this bond and everything, good luck. You know, we, we now have this name together, and that's awesome. I'm, I'm just so excited about it. Just great to have you on board. First of all, I would have got slapped so hard. That wouldn't mean anything. No, what meant something is that every day we spend time together. We build that relationship. And over, we're coming up on 33 years in November. In this 33 years, there's been an ebb and flow. There have been times when I was so busy with business that I let that lack. That I let, at that time Yvonne wasn't around, but I let, I let 
my relationship with Brooke lack because I was so intertwined with business, so focused on that. And you know what? When we do that, our life suffers. But not just our life, the lives we touch. See, Jesus wants you going after a relationship with him every day, every moment of every day. There is not a thing that you need to do in your, day, in your day that he does not want you to be a part of, or that he doesn't want to be a part of with you. He doesn't want you holding back and categorizing something that you just kind of keep for yourself. There's nothing that's supposed to be kept for yourself. It's supposed to be you and him. Now, there might be things that I have for myself that Alexis isn't part of, right? I mean, as much as I wish she would enjoy going four-wheeling or skiing or, you know, fishing or hunting or something like that, that's something I can say is for myself. But if I don't include God in that, I'm making a mistake. Because, see, I can't hold things back just for me, me without including God there. And, and I'll tell you, for, for those of you who, who may be wondering in your mind, how do you build toward this righteousness? I, I, I had all the same issues that, that many of you do, or many of you have. And how I found, I can only tell you how I did it. When, when you walk with the idea of building a relationship with the Lord, and you are striving to learn his voice, building relationship with him, knowing him, knowing his word. Oh, man, I'll tell you what built in me was this feeling that I don't want to let him down. I could just picture his face if I let him down. And, and not that the motivation is, is just him accepting me or not accepting me. He always will accept me. But don't think he isn't hurt by our sin. <laughs> you're, you're foolish if you think that. Well, he's God. He's, he's a big boy. He can handle it. Oh, man, I, I never understood until I became a pastor what it was like to have people turn on you and say things about you whom you love, your own family, people closest to you. I can only imagine how Jesus felt going back to Nazareth. I mean, these weren't strangers. These were people that knew him. It wasn't just that he started teaching in the synagogue and, and like God came over him. And, and no, he was God from birth. He grew up speaking in the synagogues. In fact, at 12 years old, they left him in Jerusalem by accident because he was speaking in a synagogue. Right? So they, they had an opportunity to see who he was. But they couldn't separate the fact of their own sin and recognize that somebody else could walk closer with God. Don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. It is all, it is offered to all of us. That's what Jesus paid for. This relationship is offered to every single one of you as much as it is to me. And don't think for a moment that when we choose things that hurt God, don't think for a moment that it doesn't hurt him. I mean, you could read his reactions. How about when Israel, you know, after all he had done, taken him out of Egypt. And, and by the way, there's so much to that. Man, go peel back the layers. It's not just on the surface level that you're reading. There was extreme betrayal. When he did all that for them, Moses went up to literally receive the law. And they turned and they started to worship a God that they had fashioned by their own hands. Look at God's reaction to that. Don't tell me it doesn't hurt him. It does. It hurts him. It makes him angry. 
That's what we call righteous indignation. Okay, and that is the cool Christian way of saying it's okay for God. But the truth is, it was righteous. Because when God gets angry and he literally wanted to kill them all, he said to Moses, you know what, dude, I'm going to get rid of them. We're just going to start over with you. You know, and Moses is like, oh, wait a second. (laughs) I'm 80 years old here. Right? And God persuaded the Lord. Now, did the Lord know that he was going to change him? Of course he did. He knew the end from the beginning. You could look at that all as a test for Moses. You could look at whatever. I don't care. But the truth is, God was angry. That is the truth, because he said it himself. And that anger was righteous. That anger was called for. God hates sin. You know what he hates worse than sin? When sin destroys those who love him and he loves. I'll tell you, I don't understand the patience of the Lord. I'm thankful for it. I don't understand the patience. See, this was available to happen 2,000 years ago when Jesus paid for it. It's been paid for. What we are going through now in this transparency, in this switch, in the readying of the bride, that was available 2,000 years ago. Imagine the patience of the Father waiting. You know, I, I, I don't know his timeline, but maybe, maybe he had a gap of time that, okay, by this time, whether they call me or not, it's going to happen. I don't know. Because he does have a timeline. All I know is we're there. Now, could we have a few more years left? I don't know. I don't care. Man, man, pray. I, I don't want a day left. I want him to come with his justice, come with his righteousness now. Why? Because the world will be better. Those who hate him will be happier. How's that for love? How's that for love? I don't want them to suffer. If they don't choose Jesus, that's their choice. But you know what? By choosing Jesus and being placed in leadership, it could be better for them. That's what God says. And that's what will happen. And the bride needs to get the stick out of there you know where. And trust him. Trust him, not get bogged down by the crap that affects us every day in these emotional things. Keep your eye on what God wants you to look at. Keep your eye focused on him, your choices focused on him. And he will bring this change. He will. You're starting to see it. You see it in the sacrifice of this Afghani church. You're going to see it in the sacrifice all over. We see it in the sacrifice of the Nigerian Christians. By the way, it happens there. It happens almost every day there. But yet the world doesn't know it. We do because we see it. We hear about it. It happens all around us there. Don't be blinded to the fact that this hasn't happened all along. It has. That's been the travesty. God wants to free us from that, even free the world from that, placing the bride, which is really his son, in charge. Alexis, come on up. I have been praying and was praying even this morning and saying to the Lord, I just want to be where you are. I want to be where your spirit is. And part of choosing him and seeing things through his lens is seeing 
his thoughts that are different than ours. And the Lord just was reminding me of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, that his thoughts and his ways are not ours. And we will unpack um, more mercy and what that really means and what it can look like when it's not filtered with Holy Spirit only and how it can manifest and become toxic. But I'll, let me just say this before we close in prayer. Um, when you choose the Lord in surrender and you want his ways and you want him to move in his power and sovereignty and to unfold his will being done on earth as it's been planned in heaven, it's, it's really a lens of, Lord, what are you breathing on? That's what I want to see. And there is story after story in the word of God that is not, that is unorthodox, if you will. It's an unusual way of going about it. Who would have ever thought that the discipline of the Lord for a prophet to not be obedient in going where the Lord told him to go would be to spend three days in the belly of a whale? You know, you, you see time and time again how the Lord has ways of working and moving and changing and bringing about freedom in people or people groups that aren't ways that we would logically think. You know, we think, well, we would do this and we would do this. We maybe sit him down, give him a good talking to, you know. Look at the word of God and how he works. The, the most controversial thing in our recent history, real recent history, is being able to see that like an Isaiah 45, Cyrus though he did not know me, would actually be used of God to bring about freedom and a change in this nation through our modern day one, Donald Trump. I mean, you just say those two words and people get an uneasy squeeze. And yet, how many believers could not see that God was breathing on him? They were looking through the lens of, well, the way to change this nation is to get a, you know, a Christian, a person that's, you know, been a believer and has walked right and, you know, has never been, you know, never been, you know, promiscuous in any way in his past and he's a good righteous man and that's how, you know, God will change this nation through a righteous man. Maybe, maybe not, depending on how the Lord works. And God has used mouths that we maybe couldn't make sense of, but there's plenty of examples in scripture of that. And so look through the lens of what God is breathing on and what God's justice looks like is the same thing. How he begins to move and work in, um, in this great shaking that we, we talk about it, we're praying about it. I hear it prayed on the prayer call, but how he begins to shake up our lives will be his way and his way alone. And it will bring that choice. And um, I am, um, I think the Lord is bringing me to a place where I am just only wanting to be where his spirit is because, you know, even Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I often think that, Lord, I can't, I can't face anything. I can't face anything with clarity, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can stand and discern and walk and face opposition or, or um, the oppression of mandates or the, you know, the, the rise of various evils around us. I can face things in the right way when, when your spirit is within me. That's what we need. So focus only on him and choose him. And, um, and then the gifts of the spirit, if you have been given the gift of mercy, in a powerful way, the gifts of the Spirit will flow through you with purity. But when we, when we just extract them and kind of work them and allow our emotions and different things to, to infiltrate those, they end up going awry and, and it messes things up. So this is such an important word. Um, I pray that you believe today that freedom is worth fighting for, for yourself and for those who you are interceding for. Because we are interceding for a lot of people right now. A lot of our loved ones, our, uh, our neighbors, our friends, you know, uh, levels of authority in this nation for the, wake, the great wake up. There's, uh, there's a lot of people that uh, you look around and you're like, has everybody gone mad? Has everybody gone crazy? You know, we're praying to intercede for a lot of people to wake up. And the waking up isn't just wake up to become logical. 
That isn't a waking up. The waking up is to see that there is a God and a God lens that is the only lens that will help us to navigate through these times in which we're living. So that is what we, we pray for. But let's just close in prayer. Father God, I thank you. Thank you, God, so much that you are God alone and that you have said to us that when we seek you, we will find you. You said, ask and we'll receive. Knock, the door will be opened. Seek and we'll find. God, I thank you. I thank you, God, that there are, there are many things that you have given us in promises. And Father, we just stand today on your love and the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you will give us the Holy Spirit when we ask of it, Lord. You will not give us a scorpion, a snake, or a stone. The three things that will damage us, that will harm us. But God, when we seek you, you will not then give us deception. You will give us your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for that, God. I thank you, God, that our dependency on you is what will help us to see what you are doing. So God, I pray in agreement with your ways. I pray in agreement with your ways that are higher than mine, which means I won't understand all of them. But I will trust and submit that one thing you've promised is that I will not lose you if I'm seeking you. And that is what I can trust in. In these times when we, we just, there's so much we don't understand. But God, you've shown us, you've shown us, God, that you will direct our paths if we lean on you and trust in you and not lean on our own understanding, which is where mercy goes so awry, is when we look through our own lens of emotion, our own lens of what we think we're supposed to have from you. God, let us see truth through your spirit. And I just pray, God, the great awakening God, I know it's already beginning, God. People are beginning to wake up. But in some, in some places and pockets and lives, the squeeze is still needed for the clarity. And that is why we will see more of what has been laid out so clearly in Scripture of these perilous times that are upon us. But God, I thank you. I thank you, God, for what you will bring that will open our eyes because open eyes are, we are better off. We are better off when our eyes are open to who you are and what you're doing. That is the victory walk. That is where we are more than conquerors, that nothing will separate us from your love, that if you are for us, who can be against us? That's the victory we walk in, God. So we need you. God, I just pray that you'd continue to do your will. Take this word and let it go deep within our hearts that it will produce the fruit that it is intended by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray all of these things today in the name of Jesus. Amen.